Hey guys and gals, I'm Pal, and welcome back to Pikmin 2. And what a long time it's been since those words were last uttered on the channel. And by design, by design, I intentionally waited a long time until I released this episode. Unfortunately, that plan also kind of lended itself to being fertile ground for my procrastination to grow, so maybe this was released a little bit later than I wanted. But isn't that just the nature of this Let's Play, as we head into the final area to show off the last few things that I was unable to shed light on during the Let's Play? Isn't that just reminiscent of how this Let's Play began? I waited two, three years to play Pikmin 2 because I wanted my style, I wanted my editing and my commentary to be capable of, gi of giving this game justice. And why? Why is that? Well, I think it's because it impacted me so much. I think it's because that even as we go into this area, we, we see the first thing that made this game great for me. Above games like even uh, Xenoblade Chronicles and Breath of the Wild, which are probably also in my top three, along with Pikmin 2, those games impacted me in a way, changing my perception of video games for Breath of the Wild and just reality in general for Xenoblade. But those can be quantified. Those can be put into a box. Pikmin 2, having played it during my childhood, having been essentially raised on it. Also, it's really weird to see this whole, th all these Pikmin again. It's been so long. Pikmin 2 impacted me in a way that I can't really quantify because it changed my baseline perception of reality from the get-go. Whenever I look at a why are you here? Ah! Um, <laughs> where was I going? Okay, well, I, I need to answer this guy anyway, so kill him, I guess? Die! This is actually kind of convenient. Die, goodness gracious. Pikmin 2, from the moment you're set into these areas, gives you a name of that area. The Wistful Wild. Giving you a, a perception with which to see each season. And for a very early child playing this game, still in the foundations of, of free thinking and developing a worldview, it changed how I view everyday reality of those seasons. Wh you Hello, Humming Pikmin. You have that wistful wild, where you're wistful for what you just left, the best seasons of the year, the, the long dry season of summer and spring. You have the value of repose as you bide your time, patient for when those good seasons will start again, thankful that you just passed through the worst of it, the worst of it being fall, the most dreary seasons of the year. As you head into spring and you're awakened, refreshed, as you're filled with hope for what's to come. It's only going to get better with summer right around the corner. And then you have actual summer, which is perplexing, because you're not sure whether or not you should appreciate it or be sad for what's to come. Winter and fall. These things, for an eight-year-old child, still looking at things and trying to come up with unique thought, were very, very mold-shaping. They're very personality-defining. I now can't think of the seasons, which you see every day, without these tracks coming to mind, without these memorable tunes and vistas. These areas exemplify the season in my eyes, because I had that influence growing up. And I guess that's why I wanted to do this game justice. It's why I waited so long. Since this was going to be my first Let's Play, I wanted to wait until my the quality of my commentary and my editing could do this the justice that I think that it deserved, to present it in the best possible light. And it's why I waited on this episode. I wanted to make it a little bit longer since it was our send-off to the series, and I knew that I couldn't do that if it had immediately followed the series, where there was a bit of fatigue on behalf of you guys, the viewers, and myself having played the game for so long. Oh, that poor pur purple Pikmin. And if you look at the day counter, I actually had to skip ahead 30 days, thus exemplifying that wait, because these are the Ujadani. These are 
hidden enemies in the game that only appear on days 31, 61, 91, 121, 151. The game does not mention them. However, the e-reader cards do. There is one e-reader card for these enemies, calling them Ujidani, and also referencing them as ticks, which, if I can put the, uh, the er, in-game model up on screen, enlarged, you can see that that's almost accurate. It's especially accurate for what comes out of them once they're attacked. You're going to want to attack them with white Pikmin. Any other Pikmin will be attacked by them and poisoned. Attacking them causes them to burst and sprays or nectar coming from them. Now, Pikmin 2 has an on-screen limit of 30 pools at a time. It can only display 30 pools on screen. I'm not sure if it's on screen or on map. I think it's on map. And once you reach that limit, which you reach it almost instantly, then no more will be gained. So thankfully, I have a few leaf Pikmin here. I can throw into the nectar and get those off screen. Um, otherwise, I'm going to have to drink up some of the the sprays, farm uh, the Ujidani more, and then rinse and repeat it so I can get the maximum value out of it. Speaking of maximum value, there's a trick that we utilized, or I utilized, in the Let's Play, uh, which allows you to double up on sprays. By pushing the inactive captain into a pool of spray, it will cause them to drink. The active captain, you can then make them run into the pool, and you can double up every single pool of spray you see. Looking at here, just like that. And from this, Future Pal is going to do a count of how many sprays I get from doing this. I'm going to speed it up just for sake of viewership since this episode is going to be a bit long. You don't need to watch me do this trick. You have already gotten the gist of it. But you can get so many sprays from this. So many. It is easily the best trick to get sprays in the entire game. The only reason why I didn't make use of this in the Let's Play was because on day 31, we were a bit busy ending the game, doing, uh, completing the last couple of caves with the Wistful Wild being our last stop. Wait, there's more? Oh. I... I completely forgot about that. Uh, get out of the way. Uh, that's not good. Come on, Pikmin. Is there one over there? No, I have all of them. Good. Get out of the way. I forgot that there are more. So there's one There's one location over there, and I'm not going to be showing this one. In fact, I'm going to show off their poison attack. Woo! Look at that! Oh, no, 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 no. Whistle. Whistle them. Now murder them again. Look at this. Yeah, so there are two locations of the Ujidani. There's one over on the stump, the stump next to the Hole of Heroes, and there's one outside of the Dream Den. And this is easily the best way to get sprays in the game. Considering that I hit the, the spray limit almost instantaneously upon attacking these guys, and considering the, the trick of doubling them up, you could probably easily get... 100 sprays from this? Which is crazy. That is absolutely crazy. Okay, we're going to be going over the, to the Dream Den because something awaits us at the very bottom, the final floor of the Dream Den, after we've defeated the Titan Dweevil. If you remember, he had treasures attached to him that he used as weapons. Now he doesn't. Now we have those. So what will the fight be like once we reach the bottom? We're going to be finding that out today as I go back through the Dream Den. After I drink these sprays. I think I started these out in like the 20s of some of the sprays, and now I am in the 50s. Wow. Okay. Into the Dream Den we go! <laughs> oh, I did it! Oh, I did it! So I discovered this after I recorded the initial episode, and in fact, after I finished editing the initial episode, I was ready to launch this when I stumbled across 
the second instance of Totaka's song in Pikmin 2. And it blew me away that I would miss something as big as a second instance of Totaka's song when doing my initial and very thorough, might I add, research of the game before I let's played it. I was so thorough, I combed everything, and I never saw this. And I decided to have a bit of confidence in myself and research why I didn't see it. And what I found blew me away. I didn't find this because it had not yet been discovered. In fact, it was discovered after 15 years this month. January 3rd, 2019 was when this was discovered. After 15 years. If I had not waited and procrastinated making this video as long as I had, I wouldn't have been able to feature this. It would have been just something I tweeted about or made a special tiny bonus video about. But instead, I'm able to include it in the main episode and it makes me so happy. I'm so happy to show this off. So the trick is rather simple and it's best executed on a Wii or a GameCube. A Wii, or rather, it's best executed on the GameCube version running it on a Wii or a GameCube. Because you, you would need to remove the memory card for this to work. You could maybe do this on a, with the Wii version, maybe? I'm not even sure. And you could probably do it with emulation, but it's easiest to just pull the memory card out with the GameCube version. When going down a floor, or when entering a cave for the first time, the game saves. Or rather, Whenever you see a save screen, you can do this. Pull out the memory card, and this glitch screen will show up. I believe if I reinsert the memory card, then it will uh, save to it, as it should. But if we linger on this screen, Totaka's song will play after about 3 minutes and 45 seconds. So, I'm going to fast forward to that point, so we can experience this secret that has been waiting to be discovered for 15 years. Oh boy, I can't wait. The holy grail of video game easter eggs, Totaka's song, is in this game not once, but twice. And it makes me so happy, especially that my procrastination served a purpose. That my procrastination led me to being able to include this in the episode. I'm so happy. Alright, let's get back to the main part of the episode, to the actual recording of the episode, since this was done in post. So enjoy the switch back over to emulation and to Pikmin 2 being back in HD. Now the cool thing about me doing this again, get out of the way, is that there are no treasures required for me to collect. I have them all. So I can just skip to the end of some of these. So if I don't like them, I can essentially mulligan the floor and move on to the next. Which I'm considering doing, looking at how tedious this particular floor is. But you know what? I I'll do the first floor at the very least, just because I'm rusty. In fact, it's been, I think, a year? Almost a year since the series ended? And I'm talking about, not the, the main series, I'm talking about... Oh, come on, swarm him. Uh, can you kill him? Thank you. I'm talking about since the Versus series ended, which still was never completed. I still have four uh, two-player battle mode uh, levels to show off, which I'll do at some point. I actually lost the footage for one of them. But that's enough. So that's one reason why it's been so long since this series was last updated, but also because... Uh, my computer went through a change in the time between uh, between this. If you don't remember, I'm emulating this. I switched over to my computer. I switched over my computer, installing an SSD and moving it over to Windows 10 Pro, which was quite an ordeal. And somehow, I, I wish I had been able to record my reaction. I kept the same save file 
from this Let's Play. In fact, it survived about eight months before I found before I found it in the backup files, and I did a jump for joy. I thought that this episode might not have been possible, but it was, and I I did I literally jumped out of my chair with my fist in the air, cheering because I I didn't think it was going to be possible. Okay, can you guys kill this this thing? murder it. Thank you. And I'm glad that it was able to survive. I'm I'm also glad that I was able to show off the Ujidani. Oh, come on, Pikmin. Come on, Pikmin. I'm gonna have to claw, kind of. Come on, Pikmin. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad I was able to show off the Ujidani. I was worried that I might have to do it on a new log, because I couldn't have used my personal logs, because those things are huge. My personal logs, which I'm going to be showing off at the very end... Oh, that thing's covered. At the very end of this final episode. Those... Oh, those, they're a sight to behold. I'm way outside the threshold for that secret. That secret ends on day 301. That is when the Ujidani stop being available to, to uncover, to find. And my personal log is far beyond day 301, which you'll be seeing a bit later. I remember the first time I discovered those, and how, once again, with this game, I was struck by a sense of wonder. And when I was planning this episode, I was able to, to experience that sense of wonder once more, going through the game, discovering unused assets, and a bunch of what-ifs about the game. One of those is found in unused music. Now, most of those, most of those tracks are unimpressive. Most of them are just alternate versions of different tracks, whether or not whether they're tutorial tracks that were unused, that are just worse versions than the ones that exist. I don't know why I was so scared of him. I thought he was an orange bulbor for some reason. Or whether or not they're they're just cutscenes that never made it in the game or are different. They they're still they're alternate music tracks, but one of them is interesting. One of them hints at something that never was. Whenever, you, whenever you're near anything in this game, if you're above ground, the music changes. In fact, you can hear it here. Listen to this track. You can barely hear it. But if I switch captains, it changes tempo slightly. And that's true of everything in the game. If you're in combat, the music changes. changes. If you are uh, in the evening or morning or noon, it changes. Specifically, if you're near a burgeoning spider wart, the berry-bearing plants containing that sarsaparillus spray, I tried to keep the alliteration, the music changes. You can experience this in all areas save one. There might be a bull bear from the sky. I think I might have to keep my crew. There is no burgeoning spider war in the Valley of Repose. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's not there. You know what? Die! If you hack in a burgeoning spider war into the Valley of Repose, then the music will play, which means that it was used but never implemented. Or implemented. Oh my word. Get out of the way! I forgot about traps. Stupid traps. I, I, I'm running. I am running. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna kill this guy. But otherwise, I'm, I am running. Okay. Uh, dismiss. And there are bomb rocks. Now, <laughs> the perplexities of this hidden track don't end there. Because... It only exists in the Olimar version. There is no secondary captain track. Which suggests one of two things in my in my opinion. One is that the Valley of Repose was supposed to be the final area, and you weren't supposed to have a second captain when playing it. That would kind of make sense. You'd start in spring and end in a dismal winter, alone, trying to find Louie. And it even fits for the Valley of Repose because you play part of it alone in the finished product. So that could make sense, but I think, and actually I'm slightly convinced by that, <laughs> now that I mentioned that the, you can you play alone in the Valley of Repose, it, that could be a possibility. But what I think is more likely is that when you're combing through the files, you'll often notice that every enemy is very freeform. 
every boss that drops a body has statistics for how many how many sprouts it will create if you take it back to an onion. Even though 99% of the bosses you can't take to an onion. So I think that a designer was just creating the the track for uh for the burgeoning spider wart. He got as far as the Olimar track and then he was told, well we're not going to be having burgeoning spider wart in value of repose so you shouldn't bother. I think that's the most likely conclusion, although it if you were to conclu if you were to believe that uh, you were supposed to play the value of repose alone and it might have been the final area, I probably wouldn't say that you're necessarily wrong. And I would encourage you to look through the unused content of your favorite games. You can find out a lot about what never was and what could have been. In fact, I was hoping that this segue would happen. The Fiery Bullblax is an interesting enemy because you can see what could have been in the Piclopedia itself. All of the portraits of normal enemies are 40 pixels by 40 pixels, except for the Fiery Bullblax. This enemy, his portrait is 80 pixels by 80, which is a property only, only possessed by him and bosses. Bosses are the only enemy that, that have this trait. Meaning that at some point he was probably intended to be a boss, but once again This is where things get interesting because in the e3 levels There are three e3 demo levels that actually still exist in the game's files Which I was actually going to show off for this episode, but I was unable to make them work um, You have to do some very special and deep intense hacking to get them to work, but they can work the Fiery Bullblax was one of the bosses in those three E3 levels. There is footage that exists of them online from very early E3s that show Bulborbs being yellow and periwinkle. Them being unique colors that are never shown off again, and in fact if you plug those levels in and hack them in, those colors are not present anymore because the color swaps did no longer exist. And that's just one of the examples of the unused cave folder, or folders, in the game's files containing some really weird and wacky stuff. There are dozens, if not about a hundred, caves that are unused in the game's files, ranging from unused versions or just alternate retellings of floors that were already included with different lighting or slightly different enemy layout, or caves like uh, an unused challenge mode cave that contained a titan dweevil on the first floor and a titan dweevil on the second. Or just 15 floor caves with every floor being exactly the same. Some really wacky stuff and personally I would have loved to play through that titan dweevil challenge mode because you get to play against the final boss with two people. That's a whole new dynamic. You don't get to do that. You can take down two different weapon systems at once. You can divvy out Pikmin and use teamwork to beat the final boss. That's awesome. And it's just really surprising to me, going back to the, what I mentioned about the music, about there being one unused track that was interesting, that when there are dozens or a hundred different caves that are all different and interesting, there's only one music track that piques anyone's interest. One would think... Wait, is this... is this what I think? Oh, this... Uh, this is easily the worst floor in the entire game. It's so mean. It's so mean. I'm leaving. That's the only area where the, the game's unused music tracks are interesting, which is a bit odd, in my opinion, considering that there was a fifth area. That's right, Pikmin 2 was originally intended to have five areas like its predecessor. That fifth area, the only evidence of that existing, being a fourth map item. Now, for the record, you start with, uh, with the Valley of Repose, so there's no map there. You get a map in uh, Awakening Wood, leading to Perplexing Pool, or you get, get one in a Valley of Repose, leading to Awakening Wood, and then you get one in Awakening Wood, leading to Perplexing Pool. Now, in the anticipatory uh, habit of the developers, there, of course, since there's a fourth one, there was a third one leading to the Wistful Wild. This not being of any particular note, because the story beat leads there. But, 
The fact that a fourth one exists n confirms the existence of a potential fifth area, which never was. Now, because of the because the, of the thematic nature of this game, the each area being based on seasons, I'm not exactly sure what this area would have been. Although I do have a theory. On the map screen, future pal, please show it. Please remember to show it. On the map screen, there is a coastal beach, which I think probably ha would have housed the final area, with uh, all the main areas being seasons. And then the fourth area being the one exception to the seasons, and that is an equatorial, re uh, an equa equatorial, yeah, equatorial region, where seasons don't really apply. There's only really one season. I think this would have made a lot of sense, but there's nothing to actually confirm that in game. In fact, I'm looking, I am looking at the, um, looking at the unused map icon, which I can show it on screen. It looks like the area would have been Australia, which doesn't quite fit in the th with the theory, but it could have just been a generic icon. Okay, uh, I'm still trying to find the, the caves over there. Now, I'd l honestly love to stop talking about going through my notes of things that were unused, but the game keeps just handing me segues for free. So I'm going to keep rolling with it, because I made notes on everything I wanted to talk about, but none of those included good se good segues. But the game is just handing them to me. So, the antenna beetle, which is in this area, I actually have notes for. Maybe I just had notes on everything, so everything's a segue. The antenna beetle uh, was going to be... Can you... You know what, I can, I can just kill him with this. Die. We recently, well, recently as of this Let's Play, if you're, you've been binging it, completed the two-player battle mode, or went through some of it, rather. And in that, you there is... Oh, uh, boy. Whistle, whistle. Kill that, please. Thank you. There is, of course, the battle roulette, where you get the, the Cupid's grenades, and you uh, get a roulette of different things that you can use that benefit yourself, or are a detriment to your opponent. Now, there are three, in the game's files, unused battle roulette options. One of those is an antenna beetle, which would have probably dropped it on your opponent's base, or maybe on their their crew, and then uh, it would have caused havoc, and you could do whatever you want. Another one of these is, speaking of segues, it's a dweevil. It's a dweevil of the opposite type which I think would have been okay to, to do. I don't think that one would have been intrinsically too powerful, but the third option certainly was. The third option for the battle roulette that was unused was a bull bear. I'm gonna let that sink in. Imagine fighting your opponent over like the last marble, and then your Cupid's grenade roulette shows up and gives you on a silver platter, like Michelangelo's depiction of God reaching down to Adam, and in his hand is a bull bear. And you know, and your opponent knows, that their base is dead. Their base is, is quite dead. I'm glad they didn't put that in. I am very glad they did not put that in. That would have been the worst. The absolute worst. Okay, what is this area? I'm, I'm flying through the, the Dream Den. I think it's 13 sublevels. It might be 15. Ah! I feel like in the Let's Play, I was scared by those as well. Let's... I don't need sprays, though. That's the thing. I, I really don't. You... Okay, you know what? I... I should I be content? Oh, he's, he's gone anyway. Okay. I'm content. Let's push him in. You know what would have been really mean on these floors? Finally, I can talk about something that doesn't involve a segue. It would have been really mean if they had if they had given you one of these rest floors, and then it's like, well, I guess I guess it kind of did. If they had put traps on here, if they'd put traps on here, that would have been the worst. Although these these beetles, the doodle bugs, are technically traps, right? Uh, whistle, got him. Yeah, these guys are technically traps, which is a segue. 
believe it or not, it actually was. There are some unused traps in this game. There are some unused traps in the game's file. There, game files. There are th five, sorry. There are five trap actions, triggers, triggers, that are used in the game. I won't go through the list of these because I'll probably get them wrong. I just know the ones that weren't used. There are seven total, five of them were used. The two that weren't is one I actually talked about in the Let's Play. I forgot about this room. Um, the funny thing is, I actually kind of want to beat this room. Oh, never mind, there's Gatling Groink. Goodbye. 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 I'm, I'm not dealing with any Gatling Groink. See ya. There's a drowning Pikmin, but he's fine. Uh, the two is one I talked about in the Let's Play, which is if a captain is around but there are no Pikmin, then it will trigger. That is the only time it will trigger. If you have Pikmin and you're a captain, it will not trigger. The other one is really weird. And I'm not exactly sure what it means because I'm getting these from the cutting room floor. I, I didn't break that in the game myself. The other one is the item. I'm, I assume that item... Uh, insinuates the thing that falls from the sky and not what it the thing hits turns into a fully formed common glow cap I, I I don't know why I don't I, I just I don't understand that but it turns into a common glow cap I hope that doesn't mean that the Pikmin would be transformed into a common glow cap because I think that would be a jerk move but this this game, judging by the fact that traps exist in the first place, oh, it did. That was almost terrible. That was almost a, a, a catastrophe. It proves that this game can be mean. So I won't really put it past the game. You guys aren't gonna. Okay, I don't want you guys falling onto that. Yeah, there you go. Turn a little bit, and then I'll launch the pigment on you. Okay, you are dead. Whew. But yeah, I don't know what that trap would have done. Turning it into a common glow cap. I think it would have been cool to have like little drops of uh, of mushroom juice fall from the sky and then a, a mushroom sp sprout from that. But I'm not sure if that's what they intended. Yeah, there are a lot of weird unused things in this game. I don't I think I might have gone through them all actually. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how much is left of the Dream Den. I... What was that? Oh, it was an antenna beetle. Okay. I can deal with that. Uh, you... I, I, I know how to deal with you now. Throw a Pikmin on you. Let you jump! Whistle them off. Hopefully there's some purple Pikmin queued up. Oh, don't come over here. Don't come over here. You plus a Wallywog are the word. Okay, he didn't jump over. Okay, now I can deal with you. Now I can deal with you. Come on. No? Are you are you good? Are you coming? No. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how much of the the Dream Den is left. That just shows how long it's been since I, I've played this game. Die. Did I live them? I lived them. They have been lived. I hate old orange bulb orbs, even though they're honestly fixed bulb orbs. Okay, you aren't that bad, I don't think. Oh, uh, it's stupid traps. Nothing can really hurt them right now. Okay, where is this cave? I don't know where the cave is. Um, can you die? Yes, got him. I got him. And as long as that guy doesn't come, I'm fine. All right, I am in the clear. The only thing that's going to bug me now are traps. This is one of the rooms I think I actually have to clear honestly. I think I do. Uh, can I take care of you? Oh, you're fine. In Pikmin, in Pikmin 1, you would have been dead. Uh, can I purple you? Yeah, die. Die, 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 die. Whew, okay. Okay, we're, we're good. We're good. I'm glad I actually get to react to Pikmin again. I, I, I'm enjoying this. I am enjoying Pikmin. It's, you know, if I hadn't saved this episode until so long, I would have said, and also started the, the next Let's Play sooner. Oh, there's so many rooms. I would have said that Pikmin 3 was probably around the, 
the, the corner, which I wouldn't mind. Don't go in the poison. Don't go in the poison. Don't go in the poison. Thank you. Okay, am I safe here? Yes. Good. But as, that, as it stands, there are a couple Let's Plays to get through before I get to Pikmin 3. Although, I wouldn't mind doing it now. Okay. We're, we're doing it. We're doing it. Let's go through. Especially because I was thinking, when I was thinking about this episode and thinking about the Bull Bear Roulette, what came to mind is, is this one portion of Pikmin 3 that I always found very resonant. Bull Bears have always been like the scariest enemy, right? They're... They come back to life, they have a posse, which makes it really hard to swarm them, and even just to use, uh, to cheap out with sprays. And they're just generally scary. And in Pikmin 3, there's this really great depiction of them, where you're in this kind of cave portion, I won't spoil it too much. You're in this cave portion, it's very dark, and you can see, because the graphics are so good, the eye shine of the, of the bull bears, and it's... It's something great. Why are you wiggling? Okay, you're not wiggling anymore. And there's just this eye shine, this like carnal eye shine. And it always resonated me with me. I don't know why I'm trying to look for traps. It was just, it was so good. And I guess that's my biggest complaint about the upgrade in this game that illuminates caves. There's no difference between caves and being above ground once you get that upgrade. And having poured through the game's files and seen how many Cave floors are dedicated to testing out unique lighting for each and every floor. That it just strikes me as being very odd that there's such a major disconnect between the game's quintessential selling point, which is cave exploration, and an item that completely removes the feeling that you're exploring a cave. It's weird, I, and I, I don't fully understand it. It feels like they ran out of ideas for upgrades and thought, you know what, caves are kind of dark, they're hard to see, let's, let's whitewash them for you. And it's strange, especially considering that the, the files containing all of the different lighting arrangements that, that we, were tinkered with aren't the only lighting files in the, on the game's disc. There is one that sets the captain's light as the light source of the dungeon so blue and red spotlights on you specifically and the rest of the cave is very dark you actually have to light things up by walking near them so imagine here we're not sure how many bull burbs there are but when we spawn in we see the vague outline of that some snoring and then as we walk closer we see our, our light reveal more and more bull burbs. that would have been perfect as it stands, the fact that all these are lit, like they're in a studio, with no shadows, no mystery, kind of takes it, it takes away from the experience, in my opinion. And while it would have been a bit trippy having those colored lights, I think it would have been a cool effect, and it's something that I think they should try to do, or they should, they did well in Pikmin 3, and they should probably continue to try and do. I believe this is the final sub-level. Yeah, it is. The Titan Dweevil once again. As I said at the beginning of this episode, we took all the Titan Dweevil's treasures away. So what's left? Well, before I get to what's left, a brief message from our sponsors. Uh, the final thing that I haven't talked about, looking at my notes here, is... Yeah, there's literally one thing left, and it's that there are some unused treasures in the game. Some of them are just region differences uh, that I won't be going through because they're kind of boring. If you're interested in that, then go to the cutting room floor and have a field day because it is such an interesting experience. If you like Pikmin 2 and grew up on it, it's great to see w the what-ifs of treasures that could have been. A lot of the Japanese ones are also just uh, micro like microwave ramen cups and that's not int particularly interesting but there are four things once again the final the final uh beta element that i haven't talked about four game discs each corresponding to a gamecube title of the era one being luigi's mansion super mario sunshine uh wind waker and in a universe exploding paradox pikmin one Pikmin 1, maybe taking a jab at how prophetic the game is, 
or how it was trying to be prophetic, predicting the nuclear apocalypse. Pikmin 1 being that the prophecy having existed, showing the hubris of society? Maybe. But I think that's just me being overly complex. I think these were just a fun, cute little secret that was never added to the final game. Maybe because it was too cute. Maybe. Alright. The final secret of Pikmin 2. The one that's actually in the game, unlike all the beta elements I've talked about thus far, is the Titan Dweevil fight. Specifically, if we fight him again, he will rise up from the ground. However, this time, he's lacking his weapons. In fact, as spiky as his legs look, he's completely harmless. He cannot do anything other than shake off Pikmin. Now, the secret isn't that he's defenseless. It's a logical conclusion that since his weapons are currently sitting in our Piclopedia, he won't have them if we come back down here. No, that's not the secret. The secret is something I wanted to show off in the final episode of the story mode, but I think it would have messed with the quote-unquote canon death of the Titan Dweevil, where he turns into bubbles and floats off into the ether, and so I saved this for the bonus episode. If we kill him while he's petrified with Ultra Bitter Spray, something special happens. So let's get him down in a very, uh, very mean killing. This feels more like murder than anything else in the game. While we know he caused us trouble, this ne isn't necessarily the same Titan Dweevil, and he hasn't done anything. He hasn't even attacked us. He's shaking Pikmin off. That's all he's doing. But... If we stop him from shaking Pikmin off and deal the killing blow while he's petrified. Okay, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, that, um, that wasn't supposed to happen. So what's supposed to happen? Of course the penultimate thing I've been trying to show off ends in the glitch. Of course it does. I'm not, I'm not going through this floor again. I'm not going through this cave again. But what's supposed to happen is he's supposed to drop these sprays, yes. But they're supposed to be in a circle. I'm not sure if I have a picture of this, but as a child I discovered this. And they're arranged in this beautiful circle around where the Titan Dweevil last stood. But the game decided to take away my, my glorious moment. Thanks, game and it, it dropped them haphazardly. Yeah, so they're supposed to be in a brilliant circle, meeting the the on-screen limit instantly of the 30 sprays. I actually think it was more like 20 uh, when I did it. It might have been because of how many Pikmin I had, and you're expected to lose a few in the fight. Oh. Oops. Okay, drink. Will you guys drink both? Nope, but I will. So yeah, this is a interesting trick to get sprays. It's probably better if you, the Titan Dweevil is not the last thing you have to conquer, and you still have some treasures left. But it's a nice reward for beating the boss, and it presents kind of an alternate ending to the fight, where you get a reward. You get, you get some closure of a brilliant explosion of, of sprays to reward you. Unfortunately, those sprays weren't as beautiful as I'd hoped, thanks to a glitch. But, they still, it still drops a bunch of sprays. And that, that's the last secret of this game. That is the final secret of Pikmin 2. There's nothing else for me to show off. I've showed off the singing, I've showed off the, the trivia on the menu, I've talked about the story of this game, which is a secret in and of itself. And now the only thing left for me to do is to go back to the surface. But wait. There's something I said I would show in the very first episode. Do you remember it? I said it again in this episode. I said that I was going to show off my childhood log. The log that started it all. And sure enough, I'm going to do that. When I blast off of this geyser... I will land in my childhood log, and I will show you, I'll show you my childhood. Alright.
Ah! I was launched from that geyser straight back into the past. It's 480p, land once again. It's 2005. No. <laughs> this is my, these are my childhood logs and these are living proof of why. <laughs> oh goodness. Of why I was past that 301 day threshold. I believe these are also my second logs, by the way, from the start. 301 hours. I believe this puts it up there as one of my top three most played games, as well as my favorite. I believe this beats out possibly League of Legends and <laughs> maybe even Smash. And, pro and quite possibly Fire Emblem Awakening. 402 days. Just wait until you see the count of Pikmin and the spray count of my childhood log. And yes, you can see that I didn't complete the Dream Den. I only have 4 of 21 treasures in it because Nova and I repeatedly died to this. Thus spawning our, our uh, nuclear arms race of sprays and Pikmin hoping to brute force our way into completing the game. She was the one who did it first, I did it years later, but that log has lost time. Instead, let's end this let's play. Where I've always dreamed about, we're going to end it in the perplexing pool where for some reason I always envisioned that's where I would show off my Pikmin totals. I also need to turn down my TV a lot because it's showing up on the, the, the microphone, my apologies. My childhood log, Three, 38 bitter sprays, which for some reason is much lower than the count I had in in the other log, in the let's play log of, of technically 35, 35 days? 35 days. But that's not what's impressive. Future Pal censored or blurred out the bottom part of the screen, showing the Pikmin count. And this is also his reminder to do so. I'm going to reveal this by going through our Pikmin totals individually, starting with reds. I farmed 4,620 red Pikmin. I farmed 6,842 blues. And... 4,294 yellows. Just wait till you see the white and, and uh, purple Pikmin count. 258 and 97. I'm not sure why this one's so low. But 258 white Pikmin. Do you have any idea how hard that is to do? You have to go through caves. Dozens of times, possibly a hundred times to do that. At 15, like 15 white Pikmin a pop, and some of them just stop showing up. Like some of the, the candy pop buds just stop showing. That is an incredible feat of 16,111 Pikmin. And there are other logs I have on other memory cards that have more. One of them has 7,000 blues, which is astronomical and took. Hundreds, as you could see, I'm on day 100, one, uh, 402, and this is my second log. I believe the first one got to day 600. Yeah. I played this game a lot. I found farming enjoyable. This is the game that got me to enjoy the more mundane parts of video games. Farming, discovering simple things, knowing every asset of how to fight an enemy. Appreciating a game's soundtrack as I listened to it for literally hundreds of hours. 300 hours of gameplay. I would listen to these same soundtracks over and over and over again. And I didn't grow tired of them. They're still my some of my favorite tracks in video games. And I ha my iPod has, I believe, the entire OST of Pikmin 2 on it. And I don't get bored of it. This game changed my perception of, of just everyday reality, giving me these themes in the background of my mind as I, as I experienced seasons, as I would think of each season in the context of these areas. And it wasn't just the seasons either. This game gave me an appreciation of nature that I wouldn't have otherwise had, having grown up in urban northwestern Washington. 
And it wasn't until later that I would attribute my love of being outdoors to all of the countless 402 days I spent farming in Pikmin. And I would say that without it, I would never have Let's Played. I would have never stuck to video games and enjoyed them as much as I have if I hadn't played this game. Nova and I would take turns, playing through a game on our each separate logs, following in the footsteps of the person who preceding us in the order to have as much experience possible playing this game which we loved. We discovered this thing. The bull bear trap. Having led bull bears in here, planting a captain right here, the bull bear will stay in here forever. Or a captain right here. You can kill it easily. We discovered every little facet of the game. And... It led me to want to discover every little facet of every game coming hence. Thank you so much for watching this Let's Play. It's meant as much to me as this game has, as this has been the most popular and my favorite Let's Play on the channel. Nothing else even comes close. Not even Earthbound. Not even Breath of the Wild. This game was the pinnacle of my Let's Play. And I hope that in the years to come, in the Let's Plays to come, that I'm able to present present a game in such a faithful and loving manner that I presented this. This took so much work, so much rehearsal, I can't see, so much rehearsal to get things right. I rehearsed the Titan Dweevil fight months, even a year before it happened, and when it happened, it was able to roll right off my tongue. So, from the depths of my heart, thank you for enjoying this Let's Play. Thank you for commenting on it, talking about different aspects of the game, and loving it with me. And maybe one day, I'll make a return to this world. I'll make a return to PNF 404 with Pikmin 3. Alright. I have nothing else to do. Pikmin 2's done. And so, I'm going to go to the final sunset and bid you all adieu. Thank you so much for watching. It's meant a lot. And I'll see you guys next time for another episode here on Pal Plays. See ya!